It was indeed a fiendish crime. Rosanna Lilly is living in the small farming town of Mayfield in Canterbury when inexplicably the mother of four was bludgeoned to death with a hammer. The murderer was soon found and 28-year-old Arthur Biddle was shortly to become the sixth individual hanged at Littleton. The 13th of December 1913 Biddle, a blacksmith, was in a sorry state when he was collared the day after the murder. Wracked with guilt, he'd come down from a bender and had ingested rat poison to try and end his life. All he succeeded to do was to induce a permanent paralysis. That meant in court he appeared a shadow of a man. No real motive was given. A three pound debt was mentioned in a rambling confession. However, he owed more to many others. Biddle pleaded guilty and in short order the trial was over and a public notice was issued for the position of hangman next to immediate start. That advert for a hangman got the attention of a German sailor, Maud at Littleton. He wrote away to Wellington for the position, only to find the job required a face-to-face -face interview up north. Fifteen months later, that very same German immigrant would be meeting one of the more successful applicants, having him place a noose around his neck, become the next person in New Zealand to hang for a crime that was even more fiendish than that of Biddle. Arthur Rodman, also known as Rothman, with two ends. And in another twist, Rotman's lawyer would later come within a whisker of getting himself hung as well. Had he have had a better shot, it was 1914 and World War One had just begun. New Zealand's substantial contribution to the war effort is often overlooked. 42% of all military age men served, 59% of those would either be killed or wounded next to every household had someone serving. Hatred towards Germans was at a fever pitch. Even the humble German shepherd dog was renamed the Alsatian. It wasn't a good time to have any association with Germany, more so for those of German heritage. Even for an inhospitious 21-year-old, Arthur Rotman, who ended up on the other side of the world as a sailor, innocently enough, and that was just where the vessel was going. To curb possible accusations, I don't know how to pronounce German correctly. I know enough to indicate the correct pronunciation of his name is along the lines of Rotman, but let's stick to the anglicised Rotman, though. Hey. At the advent of World War I, Rotman's neutrality was automatically questioned. He was considered to be a threat, and gained the status automatically of an alien. For single men like him, that meant banishment away from where they could cause possible trouble. Rotman, a sailor, ended up about as far away as anyone can get from the ocean in the North Island, Ruahini, about 15 kilometres from Mangaweka. His designation as an alien restricted his movement to this area for the duration of the war. The dairy farm on which he worked was run by Joseph and Lucy McCann. They had a young one-year-old son called John Joseph. On Boxing Day in 1914, Rotman hopped on his horse and travelled into Rohini, where he met up at a local pub with his mate, McNeil, for what you would term a Saturday sesh. Both Rotman and McNeil left the pub half cut and went back to McNeil's place and continued drinking. Rotman knew fully well he was in for a bullocking now when he got home to the McCanns as he had missed the afternoon milking. There had always been animosity from Mrs McCann from the get-go towards Rotman and she would definitely now take the opportunity to put the knife in. A pissed Rotman left the McNeil's house in the Wee Smalls, where his job was on the line, but with the blasé attitude, if I get fired, I'll find another farm. 
uh, fair presumption, given that there are so many of fighting aged men away and farms up and down the country were short staffed. The following morning, a Sunday, Botman turned up to the local dairy factory with the farm's milk, complaining about a hangover. Being a small community, the staff there knew Rotman had been on the Terps the day before, and the McCanns wouldn't have been happy with him going AWOL. Rotman brushed off those concerns, and nothing appeared too untoward. The next morning transpired much the same as the previous, except the factory delivery took place at an unusually early time, and the contents were well below what a normal level would be. Later that morning, Rotman was spotted in the township of Amungawega, where the local policeman reminded him of his travel restrictions. An hour later, he took the train to Wellington. There are no twists and turns in this one. By now, you have deduced what happened via the title, intro and thumbnail. When neither Rotman or McCann arrived at the factory the next day, suspicions were aroused nor had the neighbours seen the McCanns about the farm for a while. Patchett, the dairy factory manager and a worker, were dispatched to see what was up, fearing some sort of accident. On finding the McCanns farmhouse shut and silent, they proceeded to check out the cow shed. It was there they found Joseph McCann, with his head split open, lying in a pool of blood. They went hanging around and immediately took off back to town to inform the police. In the intervening time, two neighbours also called into the farm, finding it similarly eerily quiet and the place locked up. They chose to enter the couple's bedroom window. and There they found Mrs McCann and her infant son murdered in the bed in the same brutal and bloody fashion as had befallen the husband and father. I have tried here to be as euphemistic as possible. Put it this way, imagine taking an axe and chopping a log six times. That was the number of blows Joseph McCann took to his head. I don't think I need to elaborate what a blow from an axe would do to a one-year-old child. The hunt was now on for Rotman. His time on the loose would be brief. He was captured near Kaurori Lighthouse after seeking assistance from a working party who had just got in hold of the morning newspaper and guess who was on the front cover. His general plan was to steal a boat and sail down to the South Island. The moment the armed police put the handcuffs on him, Rotman knew his fate straight away. He also told the arresting detective Prohibitionists caught cold of that statement and started a campaign built around the premise booze had turned him into a demon. To a certain degree, he was greatly relieved it was the police that had caught up with him, and given the locals had begun undertaking their own armed manhunts, and being caught by them would have seen citizens' justice applied. He'd be strung up by the proverbials. A trial was held in early 1915. Rotman's defence team was run by one Charles Mackay. They claimed insanity. What Mackay termed a brainstorm brought on by being pissed out of a Swede. As part of the temporary insanity mitigation, it was revealed in court his mother and brother both had mental health issues. His father was an alcoholic. The superintendent of Porirua Mental Hospital testified it was acute homicidal mania and he was insane at the time. Two other doctors, who also examined him pre-trial, concurred with that diagnosis to degrees. None of this washed. The jury took only 90 minutes to find him guilty and the judge donned the black hat to pass sentence. He was hung on the 8th of March 1915. In another happenstance, Charles Mackey would also find himself in court five years later on attempted murder. By then, he was the mayor of Whanganui, a closet homosexual, when it wasn't the done thing, who had become infatuated with a hunky poet passing through town. Having had his advances rejected, and fearing the bloke would tell the township his dirty secret, Mackey pulled a gun on him. 
a lucky old you. I just happen to have done a video on this. A link at the end of this and in the description. Oh yeah, in another spooky coincidence, Mia Charlie would die in Germany, close to where Rotman lived. What didn't help Rotman's cause, apart from the fact he was German, was he couldn't explain any of his actions. His story of the time immediately after the murder was to say the least patchy. It was clear to everyone some sort of altercation had occurred with Mr McCann when he rolled back drunk to work. But that was hardly a motive to murder, not just Joseph, Lucy and their one-year-old son. The actual specifics went to the grave with him. His final words on the gallows were, I know nothing of what I have done to those poor people. I am willing to pay the penalty of the crime. It does not appear to me like a horrible sentence, but a great relief. I will die happy, facing the great entrance into a better life, and may God forgive the man that caused my death, and a great many more deaths. If this war had never taken place, I would still be a free man. I say goodbye to you, and God be with you till we meet again. The public was somewhat divided. From the start, Rotman accepted he had committed the crime and his fate, even thank the court and jury for a trial he considered just, considering both countries were at war. The defence of insanity and what qualifies as insane became a political hot potato. Rotman did have health professionals on his side. And there were those that also openly expressed the belief, had New Zealand troops not been over the top in Europe, Rotman had have been, say, Scottish and not German, both the judge and jury may well have been more lenient on him. Mental images of the son must have played a large role in the punishment fitting the crime as well. Then there were those that said that anyone who advocated for his leniency were soft sentimentalists. The judge had suggested in his summing up that he wasn't insane the next day after. The morning of his execution, the condemned Rotman also penned a letter which included the words of a well-known hymn. He was clearly ready to meet his maker. One last thing for those of you that don't know German. Rot means red. Tell me what do you think about this rather famous court case in terms of whether you believe justice was met here or perhaps he should have got life. Prost for your time today. And gentle reminder, I have a rather eclectic vault of New Zealand stories for you to have a perv at, like the 10 minute one involving this chap's lawyer. Bye for now.